And we're really, um, really pleased to have you joining us this evening to learn about your, um, your superpowers and how you can bring them to an interview. So welcome. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be sharing this material with you with my colleagues. So I'll let um, Marianne and Peter introduce themselves as well. Thanks, Amy. Hi, Paul. I'm Mary Ann Callen, also in the Center for Purposeful Work. Um, and the three of us together are um, make up what we call the exploration team. So we focus some of our activity on, or some of our work on helping students explore um, from the very beginning, different um, types of work, different industries, different ways that, that you can connect your skills and strengths and interests and values to the work that you do. And I'm Peter Osborne and I am the third member of the exploration team and Amy and Marianne just about covered it. <laughs> uh, so well, I don't have anything else in particular to add, but I'm glad to see, see uh, at least a few people here tonight. We're really glad that you could be with us. And, and thanks, Peter and Marianne, for collaborating on this. We're actually uh, launching a series of workshops. So most Thursday nights throughout the summer, we will be um, sharing some topic uh, through this format with students. And we encourage you to attend those um, in addition to this or spread the word to your friends and classmates. So we'll be doing a program next Thursday that's uh, all about um, in informational interviewing. And if you've ever heard of the term networking, we plan to demystify the process of networking and help you um, put a, build a nice um, strategy around informational interviewing and connecting with the Bates, um, the Bates Network. And then we'll be doing another program on resume um, revising your resume uh, in the summer and integrating any recent experiences into that document the following week. And in, um, in the July and August months, we're launching a series on, um, it's called How to Adult, and it's uh, all, uh, all sorts of strategies for navigating um, your own personal finances, job offers, um, benefits, um, even uh, grocery shopping and apartment living. So stay tuned for more programming about that. Um, but for tonight, we're going to be talking about interviewing strategies. And um, we, we, we were excited to talk about this topic. I think it's a topic that Mary Ann, Peter, and I all enjoy working with students uh, in an individual basis um, and helping people prepare for interviews. And, um, and we're excited to talk with you about strategies for navigating interviews. So um, I want to start with a, a little bit of a quiz. Um, and if we go to the next slide, you'll see my question. So something to think about here. Does the best qualified candidate always get the job? Is that true or false? And you don't have to answer, but just something, obviously, the answer is right there. Answer is false. The best qualified candidate does not always get the job. So, something really important to think about as you consider um, going into interviews. When you have received an offer for an interview, an invitation to interview with an organization, that's a, a outstanding accomplishment. It means that your resume and your cover letter have helped you cross the first hurdle in the job or internship acquisition process. It's, it means that according to the decision maker, you are qualified for the job. It means you and the other candidates that they've chosen to interview with are all capable of doing the job from the employer's perspective. But next comes the actual interview. And what we know is that the person who usually gets the job offer is the person who can interview the best, who can actually demonstrate their abilities to, to do the work of the job better than anyone else who's also equally qualified on paper, 
but who cannot tell that story as well as you. So what we're going to do tonight is talk about how you can do that, how you can be the absolute best interviewer of all the people who are invited for an interview. And we'll run through the agenda next. Um, we are gonna talk about the different formats and phases of the interview process so you can feel prepared to navigate all the different formats and know what might happen next after one interview. We're gonna be talking about how you can craft a personal statement to answer the very most common question in an interview, which is an introductory question. Tell me about yourself. Almost every interviewer asks candidates that question. So we wanna help you put together a great personal statement. We're gonna talk about the concept of behavioral interviewing and give you a few strategies to navigate that type of interviewing so that you can be very well prepared uh, to, to really answer any question in an interview. We'll talk about the importance of uh, asking questions in the interview. And then we'll navigate some of the most difficult and unexpected questions. We're gonna teach you how to navigate those questions. We have to touch on paraverbals, and, um, and that's always a part of interviewing preparation, something to consider, um, which we will talk about, um, and how to navigate video interviewing, because that is actually probably the most um, common type of interviewing that a student might experience right now, um, probably a Zoom interview is going to be the most common way that you would actually interact with a potential employer. And finally, we'll end with your questions and answers. Um, during this presentation, we'd like to invite you to enter any questions you have to, into the chat. Uh, and then we'll look at those questions at the end of our prepared remarks and answer your questions then. Okay, so uh, there are um, several different formats of interviewing. And um, a lot of organizations will use a variety of them. They won't have one um, and only one format. So there are um, phone interviews. That's often considered um, a screening interview. They're usually shorter interviews over the phone. Um, that then lead to a second interview, perhaps. But there's also um, video interviewing. There are in-person interviewing um, interview moments that are pro probably not as, as common right now, but um, certainly in-person is, is a format of interviewing. And then there's a recorded video format. And this is actually um, um, a, a format that organizations are using more and more lately to maximize their time, they actually ask a student to record their answers to questions just in, within the vacuum of a recording mechanism and then submit those uh, responses to, to a decision maker at an organization. So if you're invited for an interview, it could be really any one of these formats. Um, typically, the, the more senior the position, the more interview phases and it, interviews will be involved in the decision-making process. For internships, we see that most commonly there's only one interview. So that will most likely be either a phone or video interview. Um, but for full-time entry-level roles for after uh, graduation, there, there are typically two. And like I said, there's com most commonly a phone interview first that is uh, usually a, a larger number of candidates will be invited for a phone interview. They'll, there'll be a short series of questions that you'll answer in a phone screen. And based on how that goes, you'd be invited to the next round, which is typically a, um, either an in-person or video uh, interview. And then uh, as you, progress professionally and enter into uh, other phases of your career, there can often be um, several rounds of interviews 
to um, that are required um, before an offer is made and even a presentation a um, it could be a, a day long visit to the organization sometimes there are um, lunches or social gatherings involved and so those those are um, th those are all part of uh, interviewing for an opportunity and some of that uh, may sound um, intriguing and exciting, but more, more often people feel really nervous about a lot of uh, parts of interviewing, even that phone screen or even that video, recorded video. Um, that's totally normal. Um, I think everyone gets nervous about interviews, no matter how many they've had or what level they're at professionally. Um, and what I, I found, and I bet Mary and Peter will agree with this, that the way to manage that anxiety and nervousness about interviewing uh, is all about preparation. And um, I, I, a lot of times the nerves come from not knowing, not feeling that you're going to have control over the situation, right? That's, that's something that makes people feel very uncomfortable, not having control. And an interview does put you on the spot. But, um, but, uh, what I would say is that there are ways to predict what you're going to be asked in an interview. And there is a way to plan out your answers so that even if you don't know exactly what you're going to be asked, if you focus on your strengths or as we call them, your superpowers, and you have that um, organized in advance, you'll be um, able to answer any question effectively and the nerves will be so calmed down you will actually be able to breathe through and have a nice relaxed conversation uh, making you the case for why you're a, a great candidate for the position uh, if you've done some preparation before so that's what we're going to talk about next and i think it's marianne next right yep it is um so thinking about this interview as a conversation between you and the interviewer, or sometimes there's a, a committee, a group of a few people um, who would be colleagues, um, is, is a good start for calming those nerves. Thinking about this as a conversation, but a two-way conversation, you are interviewing the folks there just as much as they are interviewing you. Um, and as Amy mentioned, one of the most common um, starter questions for an interview is simply tell me about yourself or some version of that question. Describe yourself, walk me through your resume. Um, it, so this is a really common opening question, um, and it's important with any question to understand what's behind that question. Why is it being asked? So this particular question is not asking for your whole life story, right? You shouldn't start in first grade and go all the way through your thesis. Um, but what the interviews are looking for, interviewers are looking for, is a way to start a question or start a conversation in a comfortable tone, sort of a little bit throwing you a softball so that you can have some control over the conversation from the beginning. Um, they're asking for a brief introduction and they're giving you the opportunity to pitch yourself um, as a good match for this position. So here's what you should do to tackle this question. Um, give a short summary of your education and your work, um, whether that is internship background or summer job background or other things that you've done on campus maybe. So brief summary of your education and work highlights. Um, focus on the experiences and the skills that are relevant to the position you're applying for. Um, maybe there's club activity, leadership activity, um, or a specific internship project that's really relevant. Focus on those experiences instead of giving a whole long um, history. The description, um, 
of yourself, of your story should end with why you applied for the role, what, um, how it fits into your plan or your trajectory and why you're excited about it. Um, and one way to tell that story, to get all of those elements in, is to think about and plan a structured personal statement. So let's go to the next slide. So again, this is one way um, to structure your answer to this type of general, so tell me about yourself question or pitch yourself as a match for the position. Um, and if you have a plan for a structure, just like you're writing a paper and you have kind of your outline of your paper um, and you rehearse it, you will have some control and you'll feel more comfortable in this very first um, part of the conversation. So this is a three part personal statement. You open with a short summary again of your education, your background, you discuss what you've learned in that education or in those internship experiences that, um, that give you tools and strengths to bring to the position. Um, you focus on what's relevant again, you transition into what you have to offer, what's relevant that you're bringing to the position. Um, and you, again, close with appreciation for the opportunity. Um, and in that appreciation, you can talk about your goals and your priorities for your growth, especially in this um, entry level type position or even interviewing for an internship, you can feel free to talk about your goals and what really brings you to this, to this conversation about this job. Um, adding excitement, why you are excited about this position, how much you appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, so that in that summary, you are ending with some excitement and that will project you into the rest of the conversation. Um, and you can think about these elements. And if you think about this as writing a statement or writing a short essay, these three points or these three structures of the argument say, you can come back to during the rest of your conversation and continue those points. So you can go back to the strengths that you talked about in the first question when you answer another question that they ask about some of your experiences. Or you can go back to why you're so excited about this opportunity and how it fits with your um, values or your, or your five-year career goals if you've brought it up at the beginning in your personal statement. So think about this as, a, as an essay, something that you have been doing for years, right? And you're getting better and better at as you progress in your Bates education. Um, this, is a, this is a great way to approach this type of a question. Um, we're gonna share these slides with you after, um, after the session tonight. And this link here, the worksheet, tell me about yourself and personal statement is a hyperlink to a Google doc that you can use to again, write down that argument and then practice because rehearsing of course is gonna make it um, easier, to, easier to do in the interview. So knowing yourself, knowing your strengths and being able to answer those questions um, is going to help you answer this this other sort of basic introductory question, why you or why are you the right person for this position? The right person, right? Remember there are probably a few people interviewing for this position. Why are you the one? Um, and so understanding your skills and your strengths, your personal traits and why you're sitting in the chair there or why you're on the video screen interviewing, um, what is motivating you to want this job these are all great ways to, um, to answer, to, to have in your head what you need to answer the question. 
So skills, um, understanding and being able to talk about your skills and tell some stories about those skills and how they're relevant to the job is important. And there are two types of skills. Knowledge-based skills are those that you've gained um, basically through learning in class, for example, lab skills, analysis methods, coding, um, foreign languages, or teaching. Um, and <clears throat> those certainly are skills that are um, often in the required, um, in the requirements in the job description. And then there are transferable skills. Um, those things that you could use in a different setting. And you, I'm sure, understand these from thinking about what tools you use in a politics class that are also valuable to you in a bio class or a discussion class or on, on a team. So do any of you have examples that you would use um, of transferable skills that you've gained maybe from a summer internship or job or maybe in a class that you can imagine telling a potential um, interviewer, I can use this in the, in the position I'm interviewing for. Yeah, I feel like I've done a lot of theater. So I feel like something I could say is my experience with theater helps me be comfortable with other people and understand them and like be able to talk to people and just um, be comfortable in lots of different situations. Yeah, excellent example. The liberal arts and everything we know about the liberal arts education, right, is so, is such a great um, response to this question or such a, such a great thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about transferable skills. Um, so finally, to, to speak to the why you for this position, um, you should understand your personality and um, what your motivators are, what motivates you to work hard and succeed in any setting and how that translates to the requirements that you see in the job description. Um, so if I am an introvert with hyper attention to detail um, or someone who absolutely loves to read and write um, or someone who loves to be a leader of a group of peers, you can see how those personality traits and those motivators are going to be a fit for different types of work, right? So just understanding yourself and being really reflective about your personality traits and what motivates you and the skills, the superpowers that you have um, is a really, another really good way to prepare yourself for, um, for answering interview questions like that. Great. Well, thank you, Marianne. Um, and to kind of piggyback on what Marianne was just saying, especially about um, knowledge-based skills and transferable skills, um, some of the most common ways that interviewers try to get at those skill sets are through the use of behavioral interview questions. Um, and these are really common way um, that interviews are conducted. Um, so I always tell students, you can, you can spot a behavioral interview question from a mile away. If somebody asks you to please tell me about a time when you blank, give me an example of blank or ask you, how have you handled such and such in the past? That's a, those are dead giveaways of behavioral interview questions. And what behavioral interview questions are, um, are questions that are structured in a way that require you to demonstrate or illustrate skills that you have in context and talk about how you've actually utilized or developed skills in previous experiences. And it's really based on the principle that it's so much more impactful to show somebody how you have a skill than it is to just tell them that you have a skill, right? So think about a common transferable skill 
is leadership. So anybody can go into an interview, anybody, and lots of people do, and say, I have strong leadership skills. That's telling. And it's not very impactful. It's not very powerful. Frankly, it doesn't leave me very confident in your leadership skills. But if you can tell me about how you have used your leadership skills in a real situation and help me to understand not just that you have the skill set, but more about who you are as a leader, then that's really going to instill a lot of confidence um, in me as the interviewer. And I think it was Amy who said earlier in this presentation that we're going to talk about a method where you can predict almost anything that you'll be asked in an interview. Um, and that is that technique is called a job analysis. Um, and this is another worksheet that is hyperlinked on this slide that you can actually use um, when we send you the slides after we're done here. But this technique, I really love it for two major reasons. Um, the first is that a lot of students come and they say, I have an interview. I know I have to prepare, but what does that mean? Like, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to go about doing that? So this technique gives you a framework for preparing and actually gives you something to do um, to prepare. And the second reason I really like it, actually there are three reasons. But the second reason <laughs> is because it helps you to become acquainted with the, the, the connections, the match between what a job description says they're looking for and your own experience. So you can make direct matches between the job description and your own experience. And then the third add-on reason is that by doing this worksheet, you can actually kind of build up your own confidence because you can look at this and objectively be able to say, I have all of the skills that this interviewer is looking for. And from that, you reduce some of the, that uncertainty, right? Are they going to ask me a question that I don't have an answer for? Are they going to ask me about something I don't have? So this helps to, to build up confidence in that way. So um, this technique is really simple. And your first step in doing this job analysis is to really deeply read the job description. That's the first and most important step. Deeply read the job description. And from that job description, I want you to highlight the specific requirements, skills, and qualities that the interviewer is looking for in a potential candidate for this role. So oftentimes there's actually a section of the job description that says requirements or required skills or qualifications. So that's a good place to start, but don't, don't miss the other parts of the job description that may also give you some clues on what some of the desired and required skills qualities are. Um, with each of those skills or qualities that you identify, I want you to put it in its own row in the first column under job requirements. Um, I found it really helpful to actually do this in like a spreadsheet because you can have as many rows as you need to have. Um, and I really advocate for having a row for every specific requirement. Um, so list out all of your requirements in the first column, each one in its own row. Um, and let's just like, let's stick with the example of leadership skills, right? So if you see a job requirement that says we're looking for somebody with leadership skills. So you'd put leadership skills in that first row, first column, okay? In that same row in the second column, you're gonna list two to three concrete examples of how you have leadership skills. And they can just be bullet points, right? So it could be captain of an athletic team. It could be a leader in a community organization. It could be you led a project at your school or at Bates. Um, so list out three examples that demonstrate that you have that skill. And then 
I want you to pick one of those examples that is going to be your best example. And we're going to talk in just a minute about success stories. But I want you to write out this best example as a success story. Because then you're really prepared. If somebody tell, asks you in an interview, tell me about a time when you were a leader. You've already got uh, specific, you've got your best example, your best success story that you can demonstrate right there. Um, and the other thing, the, okay, so I like a lot of about this technique. So the fourth thing I like about this technique is you can be prepared for almost any question you'll get because you can't guess and you can't anticipate which specific questions you're going to get asked in an interview, but you can you can anticipate the types of things they're going to ask you about. Um, and so this technique helps you to come up with a lot of examples that you can apply to different um, types of questions. So in that third column um, of best example, I actually find it helpful to, to write out your story, your best example, your success story using this SAR acronym. Okay. Again, we have, we have a worksheet for that. Um, it's at the hyperlink here. So you can access that after you get the slide deck. Um, but in your best example column, first talk about the situation, right? So if we're going along with this example of leadership skills, um, briefly describe the context or situation in which you were exhibiting leadership skills. And tell me what specifically you had to accomplish. Like, what were you trying to do? What was the situation? Lay out the, you know, Jake, you said you're, you're in theater. Um, set the scene, right? Um, help us understand what's going on in that moment. Um, and then the second part is action. So walk us through, and I would say that in most behavioral interview questions, the action is actually the real meat of your answer. This is where you should spend most of your time and energy. Um, walk your interviewer through your approach to tackling this situation, your approach to solving the problem, your approach to accomplishing whatever it is you needed to accomplish, and give us specific examples and details, right? Put yourself in the interviewer's shoes. I'm hiring somebody to do a job. I want to know, like at this point in your hiring process, I kind of want to know a lot of specifics about how did you go about doing something? Because it gives me many insights into how you're going to be as an employee or an intern for me. So be specific um, and help us really understand and like see a clear picture of what what you did. And then finally, and when I do mock interviews with students, this is the one that they always forget. The result, describe the outcome, highlight your accomplishments. I'll ask somebody a behavioral question and they stop at action. And I say, what next? What happened? <laughs> like, you can't leave me hanging like that. So what was the outcome? Um, even if you weren't successful in something, um, that can be a valuable outcome. Um, and explain what you learned from that situation. Um, because we can't all be successful in every single thing that we do. That's not realistic. Um, so anyways, I think that as you're doing the job analysis, you get to that um, best example section. This is a really good method for coming up with some success stories for um, behavioral interview questions. Amy, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, I wanted to add one more reason why I also love the SAR formula. If you've ever worried about rambling in an interview and 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 feeling like you just keep talking, and you're not sure if you've answered enough. Um, if you're following the SAR formula, the when you just first describe the situation, then tell a lot about the actions that you took and conclude your answer with the result. It's a really nice reminder to yourself that that's enough. That you've, you've answered that question in a, in a clear, 
uh, detailed and succinct way. And when you end with the result, you can stop talking. So love that formula. Thank you, Peter. Um, okay, so now I, I'm gonna talk about the part of the interview when the interviewer turns, uh, at a certain point, they'll stop asking you questions about you and then and say to you, do you have any questions for me? And the answer to that is always, always, always yes. <laughs> don't, you don't want to say no to this question. Um, even it, um, it, it's really important to say yes. So um, there, um, we, we think that perhaps uh, um, the philosopher Voltaire may have <laughs> said, judge a person by their questions rather than the answers they give. And, and that is to say that this part is equally important as the answers you've provided to the earlier questions in the interview. So very important to, um, to think uh, and plan ahead for this portion of the interview. Um, and uh, the questions you ask will be a way to signal that you are interested in the organization, that you have done some research in advance, uh, and that you're a thoughtful, critical, active uh, thinker. And that's, that's the type of person that an employer wants to hire, right? So um, someone who, who wants to participate in a conversation about something that's important to them. And that's what you're gonna be doing by asking them some questions. So, um, how do you prepare for these? So, of course, doing some research about the organization will be very helpful. Um, and it's important to read an organization's website um, and know a little bit about the person who you're meeting with, if possible, research their story on LinkedIn, understand the position. We've talked about that by doing that job analysis that Peter described. Uh, and I also recommend doing some industry research, um, understanding trends, reading any news about the organization or about the, the industry that you're interviewing in, um, and having some smart questions. Uh, what, do I mean, what do I mean by smart questions? So um, it's important to make sure that your questions don't have obvious answers. You don't want to ask a question that could be found by simply reading the organization's website. Um, you wouldn't want to ask something like, what is the mission and value statement of this organization? Well, my goodness, you should have read that already um, and known that. And then perhaps ask a meaningful question about that. Like, I understand that your mission is this. How does that show up on a daily basis in your organization? What would other employees say about that mission? How does it motivate you all to do the work that you do? So these would be questions that would demonstrate that you know something about the organization and you want to know more. Uh, another important or uh, another strategy that actually makes an interviewer um, quite impressive is to ask questions about something that's already been mentioned in the interview, to explore something in more depth that may have been briefly touched on, but that you've heard in the moment, that you may not have even been able to prepare for, but that you heard them talk about uh, an issue or a problem or a, a project that's coming up and you might go back to that and say, I want to understand that more. I want to know more about what you were mentioning when there was that project coming up that needed to be tackled in the next six months, explore that with them and have a conversation as if you might be the person who could help them with that problem. It's going to demonstrate excellent listening skills and really position you in the conversation as a, um, a colleague and a partner, thought partner around that problem as opposed to um, a person who's who's not quite yet a part of the organization. Um, and a, a tip I strongly recommend is to write down several questions. I like three or four questions written down so that if 
every question you had, um, if every question you'd thought of in advance <laughs> has already been answered in the conversation, you might have a few extras to ask. Um, usually there's time for one or two questions. So the hope is that if you have three, four or five questions prepared um, and you've been an active listener during the conversation, you'll be able to ask uh, one or two at the time when they wonder about your questions. And then finally, um, if, if you're absolutely stuck and you don't have, if every question has been answered, I think it's really nice to ask them, is there anything else you need to know about me to understand how I could be effective in this role? And this can turn the conversation back to your background or your story, but it could actually also um, reassure you and the interviewer that they have all the information they need about you in the context of this position. We've attached a link to this um, slide that um, goes right to our interviewing guide. And that guide, which is on our website and also available in Handshake, has um, a list of questions, good questions to ask in an interview. So I'd also suggest consulting that before you head into an interview to get a few other ideas for possible questions to ask. Amy, can I interject one thing there? Um, in, in terms of writing down three to four questions and listening for other interesting topics that come up during the course of the interview, um, know that you should always come to an interview with a pad of paper and something to write with. Always come prepared with that. Um, and it is absolutely fine to take notes during an interview. Um, it demonstrates your thought process, it demonstrates how you're listening, and it's totally fine to make a note of something interesting or curious that you've heard and to come back to it later. Great, thanks Marian. So after an interview, uh, a couple really important things um, and next steps. So um, we strongly recommend sending a thank you note um, within 24 hours of your interview. And uh, I think the jury's out on email versus handwritten. I think that um, an email is a very um, immediate response. I think that that's a strong way to say thank you um, right after an interview uh, within 24 hours. Um, a handwritten note is also um, a very thoughtful way to, um, to reach out and, and send appreciation. Marianne and Peter, do you have a, a personal opinion? What do you recommend, email or handwritten? I think for most people, email is gonna be the best bet just because of how expedient it is. Mm -hmm. But if you can do a handwritten note and guarantee that it's gonna to get to your interviewers fairly quickly, that actually is the better way. What I did on my first job interview after I graduated college, um, it was on a college campus and I brought thank you notes um, with me to the interview. After I finished the interview, I found a quiet place on campus. I wrote out thank you notes and then I put them in campus mail. <laughs> and I knew my interviewers were gonna get them the very next day. That is a pro um, tip right there. So <laughs> that's not always possible everywhere, but that's, that is one, one thing that definitely can set you apart. And I say email. Mm -hmm. um, I do love getting a handwritten note, but email is um, immediate. You can do it later that day um, or at least within 24 hours. Um, and it just is a guarantee that it's gonna get done. There's a comment from Cam here. Yeah, handwritten notes do feel more, more uh, sincere. Um, and they're just more, it's true, they are more personal. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Yeah. The, the challenge is, I mean, 
oftentimes um, people are making hiring decisions. Like I'm thinking of hiring committees I've been on at Bates and other places. Often we're literally meeting to make a decision at the end of the last candidate's interview. And if, and so that's the, I think that calls attention to um, how impactful email can be and its immediacy in that type of situation. But I do agree. If you can get if you can get a handwritten note there quickly, that, in my opinion, is the is going to be your better bet. But that's not a guarantee. Great. Uh, oh, um, a few other details for that that note. Um, we do recommend that every person who you interviewed with should receive a separate note. So in, instead of a group email or a group note. Um, if you've if you've met with several people, you want to be attentive to each of those people and their contact information. So this is another pro tip is while you're at the interview, ask for a business card of each person you've met with or go to the front desk of the office and gather them for each of the people who um, who are there. And um, another pro tip is to to write down on the back of that business card a little bit of the detail that you may have discussed with that person that will allow you to personalize the note um, whether it be email or handwritten and cite a specific detail that you talked about with them um, and this this makes um, a, a really nice impression and um, and then, of course, in every note, you want to reiterate your interest. Um, talk about why you would like to work there and, um, and, and just reinforce the fact that you feel strongly um, about the opportunity, how excited you are about it. So I wanted to spend just a minute talking about expecting the unexpected questions. and. Um, I want to, I can't overstate that these are not, you know, super common questions, but I think it's another part of the uncertainty that Amy talked about before. Like, what if they ask me some off the wall question? Um, and this first question about how many golf balls will fit inside a Boeing 747, that's just an example of an off the wall question that is very rare, but people, a lot of people when they're preparing for the interview have it in their mind that they're definitely gonna get asked some question like this. And so I just want, okay, you can prepare for that too. Um, in a question like how many golf balls fit inside a Boeing 747, um, it's not about getting the right answer. There's no right, there isn't, who can know that? Well, somebody does somewhere, but that's not you. Um, <laughs> it's not about getting the right answer. It's about helping the interviewer understand how you first deal with something unexpected, because you can bet they're watching how you react to a question like this. And then how do you talk through and approach this problem, make appropriate guesses, and provide a well-reasoned and logical estimate? Um, so like if you're saying, well, I, you know, I, a, a golf ball is six inches in diameter. Well, that's not a well-reasoned guess. I mean, it, that's not, that's not, um, it's not good. Uh, <laughs> so it's more about helping them understand your thought process. And so in an instance like that, you have to communicate. Um, you can't just go inside your head and kind of clam up. You have to communicate and talk through um, how you would approach this um, question. Um, let me teach you a phrase that I think can be the most useful thing when you go into an interview. Um, that was a really good question. Do you mind if I take a moment to think about it? You can use that phrase in its iterations as many times as you want in an interview. Um, because this is not supposed to be a rapid fire, they fire questions at you and you rapidly respond with answers. Um, I think most any reasonable interviewer in this world would prefer a well thought out response over a quick response. 
And if that means that you take 10, 15 seconds to jot your thoughts down on, a, on the pad of paper that you will inevitably bring to your interview, um, then that is absolutely encouraged. Um, and that goes for other questions like, um, if you were going to be, if you were a color, what color would you be? Or if you were an animal, what animal would you be? Um, these are all, you know, there are no right answers to any of these questions. I think what, in the rare occasions that people ask them in interviews, it's more about understanding how you approach the question than it is what your actual um, answer is to it. And I will say that I've never, I've never been asked a question like that in an interview, um, ever. But, you know, a lot of people hear the stories and so they think about it. I think a more common question is something along the lines of, what's your greatest weakness? I think that's like the, that's kind of the cliche way that people know this question, but I think other ways that you might receive it are, you know, what, what's your greatest professional challenge? Or what do you, what would you see as being the most challenging aspect of this job for you? And I think um, a lot of really bad advice will say, pick a weakness that's actually a positive. Like I'm a workaholic, I work too much. That's, it's kind of a cop out and it's not a very good um, response. What I would suggest is to identify something that's actually a professional challenge for you and discuss how you've overcome or compensated for it um, and talk that through, right? Everybody has weaknesses and challenges. Um, so that's, those, that's a, some, some iteration of that question, somewhat common. Um, I don't want to spend much time on case interviews and technical questions, but if any of you are thinking of pursuing um, careers in something like consulting or even some general business areas, um, you may want to familiarize yourself with the case interview, um, which is really common in consulting. It's a type of interview where the applicant is presented with a business scenario, a challenging business scenario that they must investigate and propose a solution to. Um, and in that instance, again, they're really trying to figure out how do you approach a problem? How do you, what are your problem solving abilities? And you have to communicate in those instances. Um, and then another type of question, the technical question is, is fairly common in financial services, in banking, um, and also in some technical fields like um, you know, computer science or engineering, something like that. Um, and these are, these are questions that are designed to get at your in-depth knowledge of not just financial, but, but industry-specific concepts and processes. Um, and especially for either of these interview types, if you're, if you're someone who's wanting to pursue one of these pathways, practice, practice, practice. Um, the vault guides, which you all have access to through Handshake, um, have some excellent resources for these interview types. And we actually offer mock interviewing um, in purposeful work for both of these types of interviews. So um, back to some more general um, things to remember about about communicating during your interview. The paraverbal and nonverbal aspects of your communication or of your messaging. It's not just what you say, right? Finish that sentence, it's how you say it. So paraverbal um, communication and nonverbal communication actually make up the vast majority of the message that you send when you send it. Um, if someone is looking at you, they are seeing a lot more than they are hearing. Um, and even what they are hearing is, um, is really important uh, beyond just the words that you're saying. One source I read by um, Rod Windle and Suzanne Warren stated that paraverbal communication comprises 38% of interpersonal communication. 
nonverbal communication comprises 55% of interpersonal communication. Do the math, there's not much left for just the words. Um, so paraverbal communication is your intonation, the speed with which you speak, your pauses and your sighs, the pitch of your voice. All of these things are controllable um, and think about how you are delivering your message um, and delivering your attitude um, and your excitement about um, what you're saying. Nonverbal communication is more physical. Your posture, your body language, your facial expression, your gestures, whether you talk with your hands or not, which is what I do a lot, <laughs> even on the screen. Um, consider your clothing, um, eye contact, facial expressions again. All of these things can convey enthusiasm um, for the position you're, you're interviewing for. Your energy level. Um, if you are doing a phone interview, which I suspect is a lot less common now, just straight audio phone, than it was three or four months ago. Um, but if you're on the phone, if you stand up, you will feel more energetic and more in control of what you're saying and more in control of the conversation. So if you are comfortable standing up and talking, um, then do that if you're on the phone. And if you can stand up in a video call without shifting on your feet and rocking back and forth, then you can stand during a video call too. Um, and it really does give you more of a sense of control and confidence if you're standing. Um, but whatever, whatever position you take, sitting or standing, um, don't lie down <laughs> by sitting or standing. Consider your body, your, your posture. Um, don't slouch, you know, don't lean to the side um, because all of these things are little cues about your attention and your excitement, your energy level. Um, so this is something to reflect on as you prepare for your interview. And you can use a platform like um, Interview Stream, which is a recording platform that we have, um, to watch yourself, to video yourself. I mean, you can do it yourself with an iPhone too, but there's a, there's a tool, uh, Interview Screen, that's linked to from this slide, which is a good one. Um, or do mock interviews with us. Um, and we can, we can talk to you both about your content, um, but also about your um, paraverbal and nonverbal communications as well. Um, and then next slide, yeah, video interviews. So even before the pandemic, video interviews were becoming a lot more common as the technology, you know, got better um, and more common. Companies were tending to do this and certainly now we all know how well we can do everything by zoom. So I don't think we're going back. Um, 100% to in-person uh, interaction. So this advice on this slide goes both for the one-way recorded video interviews like HireVue. Have, ever you, uh, have either of you, any of you done a HireVue interview? Say that 10 times fast. Um, okay, so that is one of the platforms that companies use to say, you know, here's some questions we're typing out for you, record yourself, record your answers in 30 seconds or 90 seconds or five minutes or whatever. Um, so this goes for something like HireVue or, or a Zoom interview. Um, be sure your technical setup will be successful, plan ahead with your internet connection and the whatever the platform is i mean we're we're all used to zoom at this point and there are other platforms too and your equipment there's nothing more nerve-wracking than your internet going down in the middle of an important conversation right um and then plan ahead to um to make sure that your setting is perfect and comfortable avoid background noise um, check that you have good lighting. I do not have good lighting tonight, I'm realizing. <laughs> um, and, you know, make sure your interviewer isn't going to see your roommate walking down the hallway behind you. Or worse yet, you see your roommate on your screen and you get all distracted or your dog running through or something. Um, and then again, sitting up straight, dressing for success, remembering your facial expression, body language matters. 
So all of those things just become more important when you have this barrier between you and you're not in the same room as someone. So all of those things are, um, are good things to remember when you're doing the video interviews. Um, and then more information. We definitely, so we are here. If there's one thing you've heard from us since March, we are here for you, right? We've said that on practically every communication we've sent out. Um, we are here through the summer. We have lots of resources. We can help you with interview techniques and everything else that we talk about. Um, there are the links in this slide deck. Review those, um, those resources, those worksheets lots of resources on Handshake that we are pointing to in this too. And then again, we're here. So scheduling a meeting with us to practice or to brainstorm questions or to go over the job description to see what skills and experiences you have fit. We, you know, we are happy to help you with any, at any point along the preparation for the, for the interviews. And so here's a list of some of the, some of the resources that we've talked about and links so that when you get the actual file, those links are all right there. So do you all have questions for us? Or experiences uh, I, you want to share? I, oh. I personally, no, go ahead, I personally don't have any questions besides the one I asked before about whether email or uh, a uh, handwritten note makes a difference. Because as, as I said, I've done that before for a couple of interviews I've had over the past mm -hmm. couple summers in between high school years. So I've definitely seen my mom also has some help with that saying a handwritten letter never hurts. So yeah, that always has gone a long way. But as Peter said before, where whether there's interviews where they meet right after with the committee so maybe your letters and get there in time. That's definitely a thing I'll consider when going into interviews in the future. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I guess um, my main question is like, how do I um, like seem professional and answer these questions, but at the same time, like retain my personality and like my humanity? I don't know, instead mm -hmm. of seeming like a, a question answering machine. So I think priority, it's a really good question. Priority is being yourself. Yeah. And I think um, that's one of the, you know, we, Amy talked early on about this being a two way thing, right? Um, and I think if you are able to kind of bring your whole self to the interview, and if you, if you feel you're able to have a two-way conversation with your interviewer and not just feel like you're kind of doing this back and forth of answering questions, um, that's a really good thing. Um, that, um, that bodes really well for how you might fit with that organization um, or not, right? The climate of the interview is a really important part of assessing your quote unquote fit um, for a job or a specific organization. And that, that's a little, that's something that's a little harder to put on a PowerPoint slide, but it's one of the most important aspects of an interview for sure. And I would just add that uh, when we talked about understanding, knowing yourself, and there was a point about what your motivations are and what your personality is like. If you can really get in touch with the why, you know, why this job and what, what matters to me, what are my values, how do my values align with the mission of the organization, you are bringing uh, what matters to you into the conversation. And uh, if you want to be planning out your SARS, you might consider adding one sentence in your SAR success story. Um, have one sentence be to, that is dedicated to talking about your why and what motivates you so that uh, they are really getting to know you and what matters to you, as well as your strengths, your skills, your superpowers that you're, you're going to 
you're going to tell them how you're going to do the job really well and then why it matters to you to do it well. And I do, I think Peter and Marian said this, but um, being authentic is the main reason why someone will be um, seen as the best candidate. It's if you, if you're real, that's who someone wants to hire ultimately. Because again, everyone who's being interviewed can, um, can do the job on paper. They, they all seem qualified, but if you are a real person who can be authentic, that's really gonna make a big difference in the interview. Thanks you guys for your time and your interest. Thank you. I have another question actually really quick. Oh, great. If you guys don't mind. Yeah. So, so going back to what Amy said about being real in an interview. So one thing I've always wondered about interviews, like for the tell me about yourself question is what matters more in that question. So like you, you guys said before that give me a short summary of your education or your work and including like clubs or activities or sports or anything you've been a part of. I, I'm not really asking like, what do I talk about more or what really like matters more? Does that depend on like what organization you're looking for? Like a type, is it like a person by person type thing or is there like a all around like solid answer for if you're going into an interview? I think um, just like with the vast majority of questions around careers, the answer is it depends. Um, and I think you're spot on. It's really, I think you have to make those strategic decisions based on what you've learned about the organization, but also what you've learned about the person who's going to be interviewing you, right? Like, let's say you, you do a little bit of, you know, it's very common if, if either of you use LinkedIn, um, it's very common, you know, look up your interviewer on LinkedIn, see where they go to school, what did they do while they were there, what does their job history look like. Um, you know, if you, maybe that person played soccer and you play soccer, or that person did theater and you do theater, like, that's a, that's a really important way of building connection. Um, and part of that, that tell me about yourself question, that quote unquote pitch is about building rapport and is about building connection with your interviewer. I think sometimes you, you research an organization or you look at the job description and you can determine what things are really important. What, what are the most important priorities of the description? Maybe it is um, being a liaison between different teams in a company. And so you know that um, collaboration is a really important transferable skill that they're looking for. If you've got a story from some course or project or club or internship that speaks to that priority that you can see, then that's one thing you want to use. And you might not tell that story right off in the answer to that first question. But if you've mentioned that club, for example, or that leadership role, then you can go back to it later on in the conversation. It reminds me of how you prepare to write a cover letter. You know, in, mm -hmm. uh, in most job applications, you're gonna submit the same resume, give or take, maybe a few changes, but your cover letter is gonna be unique for whatever organization you're sending it to and the position. And um, it's important to understand what is most relevant to tell to that organization. So and in the same way I would prepare the tell me about yourself, you know, based on analyzing that job, really understanding what they're looking for. Um, and that's why I think preparing the answer to tell me about yourself and writing it down. And I actually, I like the idea of writing a couple different versions of that and saying it out loud and having someone like a, a you know, support person in your life listen to you tell that, um, say it out loud and see which one really, which version of tell me about yourself lands you square in the space of, oh, obviously this person is perfect for this role, right? 
that's what you want someone to, the listener to feel after you've, you've given your answer. So, but we all have tons of versions of that. And so it's, um, this is where the prep comes in is in writing it out, practicing it, figuring out which, you know, being selective and, um, and discerning about which, you're, which way you're going to present yourself in the interview. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, we're all, you know, we're all here. So if you have other questions that might come up or you want to talk more about interviewing strategies, I hope you'll reach out. I had to, ch I chuckled a little bit to myself when Marianne was talking about phone interviews and standing up because I was thinking like, is, is that true? And then I recalled that every single phone interview I've ever done, I, I was, at minimum, I was standing up, but I think for most of them, I was pacing up and down my hallway. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it really does make it really does make a difference it's it's um, really funny to think of it in that way yeah great right well it's nice seeing nice seeing such a huge crowd this evening <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks for being here tonight hey, take yes, care of course. Guys. thank you yeah. thank you Bye now. good night bye, -bye. bye. thanks bye.